we started talking about 1 John, we're going to talk about all of these writings from the writer John. There is the Gospel of John. And then there are these three letters, Sister Kennedy Williams of John. We have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And they are divided in this way because they are what we think to be three distinct writings. We think that two of them fall in the category of letter, whereby another one falls in the category of epistle. And I show sure enough praise the Lord for my daughter, Sister Brittany, you do the move to the front. That's a good thing to do. You can pay attention that way. Some others need to move closer. When we think in terms of these books, the first, the second, and third John, we think of them as letters and epistles. Now I know that most of you see those and view those as the same thing. Your well, pastor, that's the same thing, but not necessarily. The form of the epistle and the letter tends to be slightly different. A letter, as you might think, is a little bit more personal, Brother Marshall. You know, I write you a letter, I write, uh, Dearest Brother Sean Marshall, how have you been? Greetings in the great and wonderful name of our Lord. Then I get into the context of what I want to talk about, and then I fare you well, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you so on and so forth. Letter, you know, signed, and here I am. Epistle is more of a writing whereby I say to the Liberty Hill Baptist Church and the greater Columbus area, to the churches of America, to the churches of Asia, so on and so forth, a general letter, more of what we would think of as an open letter. And so we would have this classification as an epistle if it's more of a general letter. So in many of your Bibles, if you're reading a King James Version in many of your Bibles, you will notice that this is called the, the epistle of John, the first epistle of John, and then behind it it may even say general, or it may say the general epistle first John. But somewhere in there you might even see general, meaning that it was written to a larger audience. Whereby second and third John, as we get into them later on in the year, we'll recognize that these are a little bit more personal, that these are letters that seem to be a little bit more personal to specific people. We believe that John was writing at this particular point, he's in Ephesus. We know that at some point in time, he was a resident of Capernaum. And that he uh, is the writer of the Gospel of John. There are some who believe that John, who wrote the Gospel, John that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the John of the book of Revelation, John the Revelator, some scholars believe they were different writers. However, others believe that it is the same John, and I believe that it is the same John. I believe that because if you read the style of the four writings, you will see the writer as he emerges in each of the, the writings. And so, as you can see, we've not long ago had a series in the, the, the book of St. John, the Gospel of John. We now are talking about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the letters and epistle. And the teens are talking about the book of Revelation. And later on next year, we will talk about the prophecy of Revelation. So we're, we're focusing on some of John's writing. So, Pastor, why are we focusing? And then we're going to have an intensive later on in the year that also will be an intensive Bible study on these books so that you can really get some uh, uh, deep background. Now, I know Deacon Arnetta Hodge is going to really bring some deep Amen. theology to this uh, intensive class. And so, as we think about that, why study the book of John? Why be here with regards to our service? Glad you asked. John seems to have a message that is valid for us right now. In the season that we're living in, both economically 
and especially socially. Because it almost seems that the world is going crazy. Things seem so backward. Some things that almost seem as though, Sister Dominic Hodge, I could understand them easily. They seem, as we often say, common sense. Common sense doesn't make sense anymore. We're moving in a direction that seems odd to me. You know, in the time that I've been a part of this church, I have performed two, three, I want to say three marriage renewals. I think I did three renewals. But I can't remember actually doing a wedding. People are not getting married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yet I'm still blessing babies. Mm. Oh, yeah. People are not getting married and yet they're still asking me to pray for them to find housing for their family. I just find it odd. That out of a congregation this size with children being born and children to be blessed and people talking about their homes and their significant others oftentimes as if their husband and wife, but nobody's talking about getting married. Except for the people who shouldn't be getting married. <laughs>
Last time I looked at my paycheck, it didn't say Pastor E. I've been accused of being such. But I know that I'm more of a teacher. And I say that because I think that our society has gotten to the point where it seems that every man of God ought to be warm and fuzzy. I'm not the fuzzy type. And I think everybody knows that. And if you join this church, then you realize that, you know, that's just where, it, that's where I fall. I can deal with it. And it doesn't mean that you always like him. The fact that he's just not the fuzzy part anymore. You go to him and he just don't tell you what he's thinking. But he will tell you this is what the Bible says. And so if I didn't give you a hug with it, I'm sorry. But I don't want to hug you all the way to hell. <laughs> and so John was writing because there was an issue in the church. The issue was that they had these folk who were called Gnostics. Not agnostics, just plain Gnostics. Gnostic, if we think of it in, in the Greek, it basically means learned or with knowledge. They were Gnostics or Gnostics. And so they had a learning. They had a knowledge of God. They had a knowledge of Christ, but there was a problem in, and so I give this to you that are in seminary, uh, rather than to think of there was a problem with their theology, there was a problem with their Christology. They had a problem in the way that they thought about Christ. Because they believed, or some of them believed, the large group of them believed, that Christ was spirit but not necessarily flesh. And so because of that, they could detach in their thinking of spirituality, Sister Jasmine, they could detach themselves spiritually from their bodies physically. Somebody just saw where I'm going with this. They could detach their spiritual thinking and their spiritual body from their fleshly body. And so what that was to say, Sister Lisa, is that I could do anything with my body and my spirit not be involved. Now, if that doesn't sound like some folks that I know, I don't know what, what world you've been living in. To think that I can come to church and be justified spiritually, even though in my flesh I'm doing anything I'm good enough and bad enough to do. And I still expect the preacher to say, I'm going to heaven like that. Our religion, our church, has some mixed up stuff going on. I do believe that everybody ought to be treated with love. And I do believe that we are a family, a fellowship. But I do not believe that I ought to pat you on the back and applaud you in your seat. If you look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, and David, go ahead and put all of the points up at one time. Just go ahead, there are three points, put them all up at one time. This is then the message which we heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. Write these three points down. <laughs> I don't 
go around that. Well, you know how it happened. You see Brother Curry. <laughs> Number one, just leave those up there. Those, those are last week. If you visit, at least you'll have last week. Number one, know what's in the light. Know what's in the light. See, you got to know what's in the light. Why is it important to be a part of this light? God is the light. You also got to know what's not in there, and that is darkness is not in there. He said there's no darkness at all. And so once we begin to understand that, then we can recognize that any kind of methodology within our thinking as it relates to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit ought to lead us to know that we cannot be right and wrong at the same time. There is no such thing as I beg to disagree with God. I beg to differ, Lord. There is no such thing as my opposite to God's right. That's right. I don't get a chance to pick and choose. I don't get a chance to sew this thing up by myself. You might can get yourself a weave at the beauty shop, but you cannot leave sin and goodness to So he says that there's no darkness in the light. We must recognize what's not there. Our sin is not in God's light. And to justify that by love is incorrect. Yes, he does love us all. But he does not love our sin. This isn't the beginning of this thing. If God is so loving as you call him to love our sin, then Adam and Eve would have never gotten thrown out of paradise. If God is so loving that his wrath and his word of correction is not true, then Noah would have never had to build the ark and deal with the flood. Somebody ought to call up Lot and ask him what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Ask him what happened to his wife. Darkness and light don't go together. And so we must recognize that God is light. And because of his purity, because of his love and his peace and his joy, he continues to beckon us to come closer and closer to him. Yes. And just as with our natural eye, we cannot see anything without light. With our spiritual life, we cannot live without the light of God. And so not only must we know what's in the light, but we must tell the truth. Number two, tell the truth and stay in church. One, we must know what's in the light. Two, we must tell the truth and stay in church. He says that if you believe otherwise, then you just a lie. Strong words. He didn't say fib. He didn't say tattletale. He didn't say short tail. He didn't say a little white lie. He said it's a lie. We must have the truth. And the truth is that God continues to tell us how to live and there is no mixture in that. And as we begin to learn God's word and as the word begins to correct us, let us not run away from the church. That's right. See, there's some folks that get mad. Well, I'm mad at the pastor. I'm mad at him because every time the Reverend get up to speak, he said something about sin. <laughs> every time he get up, he, he reminds me that if I don't live right, I'm going to hell. Well, I choose not to believe that. Fine. Well, I, I choose to believe that God is a loving God. You can choose to believe what you want. That's how good God is. But that does not make it line up with the word of God just because you believe it. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm, that's good. Just because you decide that you're going to impose your thoughts upon the word of God doesn't make it real. So Wake up out of your fantasy world and recognize that hell is real. Yes. See, I heard folks say, well, you know, we don't want the preacher to scare us. We don't want any crosses in our church. We don't want to talk about hell. Let's talk about social justice and freedom. Let's talk about doing good for the world. Let's not talk about hell. Let's not talk about burning forever. That's negative. The trustees come to the pastor, don't talk about 
give no money to a church talking about going to hell. <laughs> Too negative. You got to speak positive. But let me tell you that if you just go to that 66 book and you just peer over into another one of John's writings and you see into the book of Revelation and recognize where this thing is going, you might want to change your mind about the way you live. Because God expects us to be challenged to live better. He expects us to be challenged to recognize as the text tells us in Corinthians chapter 11, let a man examine himself. And so life must come with examination. Don't you dare be so weak. Don't you dare be so lazy. Don't you dare be so misinformed that you will not allow yourself to be challenged by the word of God as a Christian to recognize that you and me, we are not perfect. But God is. And that we need to continue to look to God to help us on this journey, to lead us and guide us on the way. And yes, there are times when I'm challenged. Yes, there are times when other saints might tell me that this isn't right. There are times when the preacher might preach against it. There are times in your Bible study that you might recognize that your life is not right. Then change, turn today from your wicked way and look toward God for the answer. Allow the Holy Spirit to move within you. That you might be better today than you were on yesterday. That each minute you that you might be sure in the things of God. Don't run away from the ways of God. Don't run away from the challenge that the Holy Spirit brings to us through the word of God. But tell the truth and stay in church. If you don't tell anybody else the truth, be honest with you and God. Lord, I tell you, I've got a problem with my life. Lord, I tell you that I, I've got a problem with my hands. I'm always picking up things that don't belong to me. Lord, I tell you, I need you to pour out your spirit on my flesh because my flesh has been so weak. Tell the truth and stay in church. Tell the truth and stay in the word. Tell the truth and suffer the consequences of conviction. Because without it, how will you grow? Without it, how will you continue the journey? The wonderful part about this is that he says not only should we walk in the light, not only should we shun darkness, but he tells us that if we walk in this light, we have fellowship with one another. How do you look at a formula for family? How do you keep the family together? You keep a family together. You build a family, not focus on family. Oftentimes that's our issue, is that we focus on family. And so we're busy trying to keep one another happy through certain rituals. I know that Sister Kelly, she likes flowers, but I don't have to bring them to keep her happy. Amen. She knows that I like fried chicken. <laughs> but she does not have to continue to fry chicken to keep me happy. See, because if in my marriage my primary focus is Kelly, then I'm going to miss it. If in our marriage her primary focus is me, then she is going to miss it. If in this church, if our primary focus, our primary focus is to look at one another, we will miss it. Yeah. But he says, God is light, and you must walk in the light. And he says, but if we walk in the light as he is, God is the light, we have. Oh, I wish you could read this text today. We have fellowship one with another. If I focus on God and what he's done, if I look to his light, then guess what? We automatically have fellowship. If I look to God, then I'll have a happy marriage. If I look to God, then I'll have relationship with my children. If I look to God, I'll have relationship with you. If I look to God, I don't have to seek to be a warm, fuzzy, uh, a full kind of preacher. I don't have 
to live on the premise of some fake smile that I give you. But if I focus on the light which is God, then I'll have fellowship with you. Then we'll know each other in the truth of life. And we won't have to lie to one another. I don't have to tell you that I approve of your misgivings. I don't have to be politically correct and spiritually dead. Just because I know the right language does not mean that I truly agree with you. Just because people pat you on your back in your sin does not mean that they're not talking about you as soon as you walk away. You know, you can be politically correct and call me Afro-American, African-American, you can call me American, and so on and so forth. But if behind your closed doors you're still calling me up, you might as well call me one in my face as to be so polished on the television. Whatever it is that we need to say to one another, if we look to the light of God, let's be honest with each other and stop lying about this thing. Sin will take you to hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so all of us, in order to truly be in fellowship with one another, we must look toward the light have fellowship with one another, and then I'm, I'm so glad that he gave us this other, this other article here that connects it all together, because he says we'll have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all, or cleanse us from all sin. I like this because he doesn't start with the blood. He starts with fellowship. Uh, Sister Ruffin, if I might... Just take us to Sunday school for just a moment and then I'll run to my seat. See, the reason I like that he didn't start with the blood, but he started with fellowship. is because you know that uh, I tend to read the Old Testament every now and then. And I know that in the Old Testament when they would bring a sacrifice to the altar, one of the things that they had to do is they had to put their hand on their sacrifice. Sister Nora Green, the reason that they had to put their hand on their sacrifice is because the Lord wanted them to relate with the animal that they were bringing in order to cleanse them from their sin. And see, the animal that would be placed upon the altar, Sister Wynn, is going in our place. See, when that animal was slaughtered as a gift to God, it should have been me and you for our sin should have killed us a long time ago. But instead of us, we would present the animal with our hand upon the animal so that we could feel the fear and the trembling in that animal before it would go off to be all to sacrifice. And so I'm glad that he says fellowship. Because notice that we must have fellowship with him. We must put our hands, our hearts, our minds toward the cross of Calvary. Because the text says that we have fellowship with him in his sufferings. And you recognize that crucifixion comes before resurrection. And sometimes we don't want to identify with one another. We don't want to identify uh, with the gory details of what Christ really did for us. But I tell you here as a Baptist preacher, I am certified to tell you that he died. On the old rugged cross of Calvary. Matter of fact, the, the old Baptist preachers, they used to say it like this, Mother Chapman, they say, and he died on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. Oh, he died. I wish I had somebody. I, I feel like preaching right now. I, I don't know if it's birthday coming up or what, but I tell you, he died on the cross of Calvary. He died until the moon did drip with blood. He died. So dark that you could cut it with a knife. He died. And I heard him say, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? But not only did he die on the cross of Calvary, they buried him in a barber tomb. In order to really have family, we got to go through the process. Sometimes some suffering might come. Sometimes we've got to die to something. Sometimes we've got to let our own ego and our way go in order to connect with him and have fellowship. 
fellowship with the true and living God. But let me tell you, every now and then, it's going to look like things are over for you. Because if you do it the right way, sometimes crucifixion will come. And so it will seem like family relationships have died. It will seem like you're the only father who's paying child support. It will seem like you're the only mother that's staying home on Friday night and not hoeing around. It will seem like you're the only one. But it's all right because after he died, they buried him, they buried him in a bar or two. And every now and then we're going to have our valley moments. But I'm so glad that early one morning he got up with power, all power, in heaven and in earth. He got up for you and for me. He died, but on the third day morning he got up. So today won't you be encouraged? Get up from where you've been. Get up from lying. Get up from cheating. I beg you today. Get up from where you are and connect with God. Why? Because the blood that he shed on the mountain was shed for you and for me. And then I hear my grandmother sing that song, All the Blood, All the Blood, All the Blood that Jesus shed for me. That power in the blood, it flows to the lowest mountain, lowest valley. It flows to the highest mountain, All the Blood, and it never, never. It never loses its power. Amen. 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 Ain't God all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? I wish you could holler hallelujah one time. Ain't God all right? Yes, he is. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love it because he's been so good to me. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. 